and happy Maryland Day. Your friends at the College of Computer, Mathematical, and Natural Sciences have a lot of really interesting stuff to show you today, including some fun science facts about bugs, stars, and even trilobites. Plus, really cool experiments that you and your mom or dad can do together using a few simple things that you probably have around the house. First up, we're gonna show you how to make a lava lamp. This experiment is brought to you by the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Hi, I'm Carolyn. I'm Preston. And Logan. And we're gonna make a lava lamp. Today, we'll be making La Vera Lucerna. What is that, you may ask? La Vera is a Latin word for lava, and Lucerna is a Latin word for lamp. To do this experiment, all you're gonna need is a water bottle, vegetable oil, food coloring, and an Alka-Seltzer tablet. The jars are filled a quarter of the way of water, and we'll put a couple drops of food coloring inside. Pour the oil into the bottle nearly to the top and give it a few moments for the oil and the water to separate. Since water is heavier than oil, you can see the water settle to the bottom. Once the water and oil has separated, you'll put a quarter of a piece of Alka-Seltzer inside. And watch it come to life. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. It's like dancing around. Here it comes. Oh, you have big bubbles. Tornado. <laughs> it's like a tornado. As the tablet dissolves, bubbles of carbon dioxide, or CO2, are produced. These bubbles are light. So light, in fact, they rise through the liquid to the top. Droplets of water stick to the CO2 as it rises and are carried along for the ride, which you can see from the food coloring dissolved in the water. At the top, the bubbles pop, releasing the CO2. Oh, look at the little ones popping up. Those the air. The blue air. So, why do the remnants sink? Well, once the CO2 is gone, the heavier water sinks back down to the bottom. Oh, look at that. Oh, that was cool. This demonstration represents the flow of lava out of the Earth's mantle during volcanic eruptions. Scientists study volcanic eruptions because, believe it or not, we would not be here if not for volcanic eruptions. The carbon in the food that we eat, in me, in you, the very essence of life, was once locked in the Earth's mantle and set free by an ancient volcanic eruption. And that's how you make a lava lamp. If you want to save it for later, you can put a lid on top. And if you want to see the lava flow again, you can put a piece of Alka-Seltzer inside and watch it flow. This demonstration is courtesy of Testudo. That's Latin for tortoise. Guess what? The cicadas are coming. Here's the bug guy to tell us all about it. Brought to you by the Department of Entomology. Hi, I'm Professor Mike Raup of the University of Maryland at College Park. They call me the bug guy. Sometimes it's hard for me to believe that I could make a career simply studying some of the most fascinating creatures on planet Earth. This year is especially exciting to me because this is the year of the periodical cicada. This year, it's really going to be a cicada palooza right here in Maryland. They've been underground for 17 years, feeding on the sap of plants. These teenage nymphs are gonna come up out of the ground by the billions. They're gonna make a mad dash for the treetops. The males are going to be singing, and here's what it's gonna sound like. They're gonna be trying to find that special someone who could be the mother of their nymphs. After they mate, the females are gonna lay their eggs, and in a few weeks, those eggs are gonna drop back to the ground, and those little cicadas are gonna go back underground and feed again for another 17 years underground. If you really wanna help scientists learn more about cicadas, hey, you can download the Cicada Safari app, photograph those cicadas, send us the data, become a citizen scientist and help folks like me understand more about some of the most fascinating creatures on planet Earth. So go outside, enjoy those cicadas. It's going to be spectacular. Let's get messy. We're going to make some slime called oobleck. This experiment is brought to you by the Department of Physics. Hi, I'm Brittany. I'm Keegan. And we're making oobleck. Oobleck is a slime-like substance that gives us a lesson in states of matter. To make some, you'll need a spoon, one cup of water, food coloring, and a cup and a half of cornstarch in a medium-sized bowl. All right, so now we're gonna put food coloring in our water so that our oobleck is exciting and fun. What color do you want? 
Blue. Blue, go ahead and grab blue. And I'm going to do red. All right, you ready to start mixing? Yeah. All right, let's try to get the right consistency here. Stir the water into the cornstarch. When you aren't stirring the mixture, your oobleck should move like a liquid. But if it seems too runny, add more cornstarch. Now the fun part, playing with it. Can I play with it? Oh boy, I mean, yeah. He's ready to get some, some messy hands. Yay! Scoop the oobleck and hold your hands above the bowl. Let it slip between your fingers. It should still feel like a liquid. It feels like weird bubble gum. Uh, oh my goodness. So how can the oobleck feel like both a solid and a liquid without changing temperature? We can thank a famous physicist named Sir Isaac Newton for the answer. Oobleck is what we call a non-Newtonian fluid. Newtonian is in Newton, get it? It means that depending on how much you squeeze it, it'll act as a solid or a liquid. What happens when you pick it up? It, so it's a block, so it's so, solid, and now it turns into liquid. Look at that. I know, it's weird, right? So why does this happen? Well, for our oobleck, the cornstarch hasn't actually dissolved. The grains are suspended and spread out in the water. When you apply pressure by squeezing the oobleck, the grains hold the shape. When there is very little pressure, the goo will flow through your fingers like a liquid. I think we did it right? Yeah. Yeah? You probably have some non Antonio fluids lying around your house. Honey, paint, and ketchup are all some common ones, but I think oobleck is my favorite. All right, so that is how you make oobleck. So it's a solid, and now it is liquid. Without changing temperature. What's next? Look up. We're going to check out the view from the UMD Observatory, brought to you by the Department of Astronomy. Hello. Welcome to the University of Maryland Astronomy Observatory. I'm Elizabeth, the director of this facility. How did I become an astronomer? Well, I've always been fascinated by the night sky, by the immensity and scale of it, how our solar system is just an itty bitty tiny corner in the universe. When I was 13, my parents got me my first telescope and I've been doing science and math things ever since, like running this observatory. At an observatory, we use telescopes and different kinds of cameras to help us see things that are really very far away. During the day, we can observe the sun and moon, and at night, we observe a variety of celestial objects, including the moon, planets, asteroids and comets, stars, star clusters, which are just bunches of stars, nebulae, clouds of dust and gas, and galaxies, collections of all of these things. Since our eyes work a little differently than the cameras, what we see through the telescope looks different from the photographs. For example, M42, the Orion Nebula, starts to look fuzzy in binoculars and small telescopes. The photographs of the Orion Nebula show a whole lot more. We have regular public nights twice a month, as well as occasional impromptu observing sessions where we invite you and your family to look through the telescopes. But there are other nights where students are collecting data for research. Will you be one of those students one day? Now we're gonna learn about microbiomes with a fun demonstration from the Center for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology. Hi, I'm Carolyn. I'm Logan. And I'm Preston. And today we're going to explore a human microbiome. Bacteria, viruses, and fungi live on our skin and in our bodies, like in our mouths and our stomach, making up what is called the human microbiome. You might think of microbes as harmful bugs that we need to get rid of, but some of these microbes actually help our bodies by building up our immune system, making vitamins, and helping us digest food. We have a mixture of pasta, beans, peanuts, and candy. Yay! 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 We'll take a handful and put one in each bowl. Each type of food item in this jar represents a different microbe in your gut microbiome. Can we eat the candy? Not right now, these are microbes, so we have to separate them and count them. The total number of objects or microbes that we count is called our sample size. We count the number of different microbes in our sample to capture its diversity. Having lots of different microbes or more diversity usually makes our microbiome stronger because if one organism stops working, another can step in and help out. 
How many pieces do you have? I have 90. And Logan, how many pieces do you have? 114. All right, I got 121. Even though we're all sampling from the same microbiome, each person might get different counts. And that's okay. The same thing would happen if we were counting from different samples of your gut, where there are billions of microbes. Since we can't count the whole jar, we can use multiple samples to get a better picture of what's in our microbiome. The object with the highest count in our sample is the dominant microbe. In this case, it was the elbow macaroni. In our gut microbiome, the dominant microbe depends on what you like to eat. All right, so you had about 56 pieces out of a 90. So what if, what's that percent? That is about 60%. All right, great. And then you had about 56 pieces out of 114. So what's that percent? 50%. All right, and then I had 62 pieces out of 121. So that's about 50%. Knowing which bacteria live in our healthy gut helps us understand how they change when we get sick and how we can use our diet to help us get back to a healthy state. Oh, that was so much fun. What'd you think? It was so much fun. Can we pick it? All right, let's do it. And let's let our microbes work for us. Yummy. Now it's time to dig up some details about fossils. Brought to you by the Department of Geology. Hi, I'm Maria Eugenia Gold, and I'm a paleontologist. I have loved dinosaurs since I was a little kid. I knew my whole life that I wanted to be a paleontologist and study how these magnificent animals lived. A paleontologist is someone who studies fossil animals and plants. Fossils form when animals and plants die and get buried. While they're buried over a long period of time, parts of their bodies are replaced with minerals and they become fossils. Paleontologists like me find these fossils when they peek out from the ground. We dig them out and study them. I'm going to tell you about a couple of cool fossils I learned about from two paleontologists at the University of Maryland when I was a student there. The first is the Maryland State fossil, Ecphora gardneri. It's an extinct snail that lived between 23 and 5 million years ago in Maryland. You can see the shell has ridges that spiral around it. This type of snail would use its mouth parts to drill holes in other shellfish and eat the animal inside. Did you know some snails are predators? I didn't know that. The second is Cuparoceros texanum a type of extinct nautiloid. If you've heard of the chambered nautilus, this animal is similar, except its shell had spines coming off of it. This animal was special to me because it was the mascot for the UMD Scholars Program, Earth Life in Time, which helped my career from the moment I started at UMD. Maryland is home to all sorts of fossils, from trilobites, scallops, oysters, corals, and plants, to sharks, dinosaurs, and even mastodons. Studying extinct animals and plants like these can help us understand Earth history and give us a way to predict what to expect in the future. Thanks for watching. Now it's your turn. Grab your mom or dad and try these experiments out for yourself because science is really cool and there's always something new to learn. Check out the link for more information.